but I don't see anybody else walking in the door, so we'll go ahead and get started. If you'd like, open your Bibles up to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Well, here we come. We'll give you 30 seconds. We started 30 seconds early, so we'll give you 30 seconds. John chapter 2. So Jesus has begun his earthly ministry. Uh, does anybody have any idea about how old Jesus is? About 30 years old. Now, we don't have uh, exact times for some of what's taken place, like the, the uh, miracle in Cana of the water to wine and so forth, but we are in verse 13 going to get our first time reference in which we will date kind of the rest of his earthly ministry off of. We'll have the first Passover. So we'll kind of go from Passover to Passover over the next three years of his life here. And so up to this point, we've seen a childhood story, and we've seen uh, his interactions with John, his baptism, and now his first, his first sign. Who knows about, who knows about uh, what he's doing at this point? John does. John does. John knows who he is because the Lord's revealed it to him. His family, his mother has a lot of confidence in him. We've seen that. Who else? Yes, so his, his close disciples there, a few close disciples. How much of the public is aware of what's going on here? Maybe a few servants at a wedding. Maybe a few servants at a wedding. Other than that, it has mostly been word spreading about from 30 years ago about, hey, there's, there's been messages from God, John the Baptist, his work, and so forth. So Jesus hasn't become the limelight, it had been spotlighted yet. He's about to be spotlighted as we get further into this. So we're ready for verse 12. I don't think, did we talk about verse 12 last time? Uh, okay, verse 12. So he go. where does he go after the wedding in Cana? All right, yes, okay, I didn't mean for that to take off, but Cana was right there, and uh, Capernaum is going to be right here on the north, northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. How long does he stay there right now? Yeah, not many days, not many days. So it's just a temporary visit there, and then he's going to he, he's going to to leave there, and we'll see him in verse thirteen at the Passover in Jerusalem. And so he's going there for the feast. What time? What time of year is the Passover? Spring. Yeah, uh, March March to April, middle of March to middle of April, somewhere in there. It, 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 their calendar is different than ours, so it's going to fluctuate some, but you're looking at spring. It's going to be close to around when Easter is for us. And so it's the spring of the year. He goes to Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple. And he, what does he see in the temple? Yes, he goes to the temple, and here they have a marketplace set up where they're selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business, the New King James says. Okay, what, uh, what, what are they doing with oxen, sheep, and, and, and uh, doves there in the temple? Yes, okay, so this is not, it's not like they're just having, you know, uh, spices and, 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 you know, egg McMuffins that they're selling there or whatever. They're, they're, they're selling things that have to do with the temple worship. And by the way, the law talked about that. If you were making a long trip, it's very difficult to bring your sacrifices with you. So when you got to Jerusalem, you could buy your sacrifices there. And of course, if you're going to buy them and you're using a currency from way off, you would need to exchange your money to be able to do that. So all of these things would be good and lawful when it comes to for the sacrifices. So the law made provisions for that, even said something about this. But Jesus is not happy. He's not happy with what he sees. Why is he not happy with what he sees? All right, it's a heart thing, okay? It, it, they're doing business. Has, has, have we seen Jesus in the temple before? Yes, all right. What was Jesus doing in the temple before? Asking questions, learning, studying, talking about the law, things of that nature. When his mother questioned him about that, he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So what, was his, what did Jesus think his father's business was? Teaching, learning, talking about the law. They're doing business, but the type of business that they're doing is commerce. Now, it had something to do with following the law, 
but it was nothing that had to do directly with that. And Jesus, he makes a whip of cords, and he drives them from the, the area, overthrowing the tables. But this would be a big stir. Can you imagine this? I mean, what would you think if uh, here, I don't know how many years this has been going on, but I assume long time, maybe as long as anybody could remember, this has been taking place. And all of a sudden, somebody comes in, he starts overthrowing tables, making a whip of, uh, of cords and driving out the people that are in there. What would you think? Crazy. Crazy guy. Somebody's lost it. Somebody's lost it here. But what he says is, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. He has a, a great appreciation for his father's house. I must be about my father's business. That was at 12 years old. Now at 30 years old, this is my father's house, and it shall not be a house of merchandise. That's not what it's supposed to be. So he has felt that the temple was a place for his father's business, which was teaching and learning, not a place for commerce to, to happen. Now, he's going to cleanse the temple twice. This is the first time. In this, uh, this time, there's no mention of him saying, you've made it a den of thieves. So at least from our standpoint of what is revealed, his criticism this first time is, you've made it a place of merchandise rather than a place of learning and study and, and prayer. And, uh, and, and so that was his, his problem with this. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it is interesting because you know the Bible condemns outburst of wrath. And so you may look at this and say, well, isn't Jesus having outbursts of wrath? Well, I'll be honest with you. When I start overthrowing tables and things like that, generally speaking, it's because I've lost my temper. But I don't believe that Jesus did. Then the second cleansing of the temple, it's interesting because he goes in the day before, he looks around and he observes it, he leaves and he comes back in the morning and that's when he drives them out. And I think that, that I think that's recorded for us because it was a calculated move. It wasn't that he blew his top, he lost his temper. It was that he looked and he said, this deserves this type of response. And, and also, it's Jesus. It is his father's house. <laughs> and so uh, he has a little bit different of, of authority there. Yes. Yes, I do believe he was angry. I think that that's right. Yes, I don't, I don't think that it was, I, I do believe he was upset about it. Right. Yeah. He's 30 now. I'm sure he came every year. Yes. He said, why is he waiting? Well, I wonder if it has to do with verse 4. So back up to verse 4, I was talking about last time. But he ends up saying, my hour has not yet come. Yes. And I wonder if we're reaching the point now where he's like, okay, we're about to start taking some action. And I wonder if this is, in some ways, kind of how he's starting off a, a little bit. And um, the, the, again, the message is we need to be well, you need, you need to be zealous for God's work, not for money. Right. You need to have your priorities right. I just wonder if there's a connection there. I wonder if these stories place back to that. Something that I meant, I know you got something to say. Let me just say this, piggyback off of what Austin said. I meant to say this. With the first miracle that was done, the water to wine, how many people were upset at Jesus for doing that? Nobody. Nobody. Anybody going to be upset with Jesus for doing this? Yes. And, uh, and so I do think that things are, things are changing. You'll see the criticism and you'll see the response here in just a second. So I want to think about this for just a moment. What do we know about Jerusalem during the Passover? Would have been full of people, would have been crowded. Yeah, lots of Jews from everywhere. They're coming to this to, the, to observe the Passover. And so I think about that and the people who had these sheep and these oxen might be taking advantage of that in a sense, setting up with that in mind. We're going to have a lot of people here. And, and their mindset was probably focused on that opportunity as opposed to the purpose of what, what God's house is for. And so, like Lonnie mentioned, 
this is pretty early on in Jesus' ministry. You know, we've kind of seen the beginning of signs, but this is going to be kind of the first time he goes into a big public scene and, and says some things. Would this have been a good time for him to make a, a good first example on the people? A lot of people, yeah. And so this has been a great time to get his message out there and get everybody on board. But it goes in the opposite direction. And I think just like Lonnie was saying, just to add to his point, I think verse 17 tells us a little bit about why he goes in that opposite direction. Then his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your father's house has eaten me up. And so that's quoted from Psalm 69. And I think that his disciples are able to recognize this is, this is the attitude Jesus has here. You know, this is not anger or bitterness. This is zeal for my father's house, just like Lonnie was saying. And so I think that's a pretty cool idea there that what Jesus was doing. Yeah, let, since you mentioned Psalm 69, let me uh, read that to you so you can get the, the picture of what David is talking about in Psalm 69. Verse 4, those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. All right, so you get the, he's got a lot of enemies. Why does he have enemies? Verse 7. Because for your sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who, or the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So what David is saying, the reason I'm hated is because I, I'm zealous for the Lord. Why would Jesus be hated? Because he was zealous for the Lord. And, and I think this is an example of that and his disciples would recall that to mind. That's right. Good point. I do think this is interesting uh, to talk about stories like this because I think the greater religious world has the correct ideas about Jesus, that he's all loving, merciful, gracious. But I think sometimes certain religious people leave out that component that he, he will rebuke. And, you know, there is judgment when necessary. And so I think this is a good example of that and seeing that in action. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Super Bowl commercial, the He Gets Us campaign, where it was it, it almost presented that just come to Jesus exactly how you are and he'll accept you and love you and almost disregarded the idea of, of judgment and rebuke and needing to make a correction. And I think the Bible absolutely tells us that. Stories like this can be tied into that idea. All right, so this uh, crazy man has come in and upset everything in the name of his father. So the Jewish leadership wants to know, all right, you proved to us that you have the authority to do this. Proved to us that you're doing this for your father. And, uh, and it's because you're concerned for him. What sign will you do or show us since you do these things? And, 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 and they're asking, prove it. Prove it. Now, he's going to work a lot of miracles here in just a little bit, that any one of which would prove that he is of God. We'll see Nicodemus a little bit later on say, I know you're from God because nobody could do the things you do unless God's with him. And so Jesus is going to give ample evidence of this. But when they ask for a sign here, it's interesting how Jesus responds. Jesus answered and said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. How would you understand that if you were standing there? That's what he just threw everybody out of that was changing, you know, that was in commerce there. And so that would be the natural conclusion of that. And they even respond and say, the Jews, uh, then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? Did Jesus say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding me. No. Jesus on occasions spoke in such a way as to leave room for misinterpretation. That's significant. Later, his disciples will say, why do you speak in parables? And one of the reasons why he gave was because it's given to some to know and others not to know. I leave room for misinterpretation because some really don't want the truth. And I, I give them the opportunity not to find it. But to those who do want the truth, I give them the opportunity to find it. So I want you to notice how this shakes out as they go forward on this. So he doesn't correct them. He was speaking about his body, but then look at verse 22. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, who got it? His disciples got it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, do you remember what the Jewish leadership was doing mocking him, what they were saying? 
You who destroyed the temple and raise it up in three days. Oh, they remembered what he said, still not applying it to the fact that they were destroying the temple that Jesus was talking about, and he would raise it up in three days. But his disciples remembered that. And they understood. And so here's one of those examples where Jesus spoke in such a way where those whose heart was not looking for truth would totally misunderstand it, and those who were looking for truth would understand it. Keep that in mind. Because what does that say to us when we're looking for truth? We better examine what? We better examine our heart and make sure that we are really sincere in that. Because... I believe that Jesus spoke, and I believe the Scriptures are written in such a way where if a person is not looking for the truth, they will believe a lie. They will believe a lie. And it, it wasn't an immediate answer anyways. No, you know, that's right. They had to continue to remain faithful and wait mm -hmm. all the way to he was risen from the dead to, yes. you know, to connect these dots here. So it's that's interesting right. that Jesus lays it out now, looking that far ahead, not just you know the next day or the next hour, but, yep. but in time. One other point on that. You may have more you want to say, and I don't. Okay. One other point on that. Uh, how did Jesus view his body as a temple, a place where God's glory dwelt? Now, that's interesting because uh, the, the concept of the temple in the Jewish mind is this is the throne of God. This is where God, uh, God dwells among men. And uh, Jesus said, my body is the temple. It's the place where the glory of God rests. W would that just be true of Jesus? No, because later on the apostles would talk about your body is the temple. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And so there's that, that essence of God is in you, that, he, that the glory of God is to be in you. And so we get a taste there of what he anticipates this for us to do with our bodies. And the, the sign here is pretty significant. Um, it's the resurrection. You know, what, what more of a sign could you want? And so I think uh, he gave them the ultimate sign. That's right. And, uh, Very good. and, and proved what authority he has. You know, he has authority over death. No man has. Only, only him who is above death can have this, this power. So I think he well answers the question in the long run whenever we figure it out. That's right. Any thoughts, comments? Would, would there be a, a single entrance or mouth that would be the There would be mul multiple entrances. So, you know, my thinking was, you know, I could see how, how this would progress. As far as you know, maybe they would set up outside the gate, but you know, other people would, you know, you would you would be subject to just one one entrance. Yeah. People coming in one entrance. Yeah. The closer you could get in there to the actual temple itself inside the courtyard, then you would be <coughs> exposed to more people, more people, more people. So I mean that, that encroachment you could see happening slowly over time where they keep creeping in, creeping in, creeping in. And I, I love your thought process there because you, you know, when we're thinking about a business and you're trying to, you're thinking, well, where do I want to build my store? Location, location, location. That's the most important thing, you know? And, uh, and so you can just imagine they're setting up shop outside the temple entrances. And, and then it's like, well, you know, we can get right here, right next to the door and everybody would kind of have to crowd through here. And then well, if we just move in. And then it, I think you're exactly right. I think you're exactly right. And uh, what we're seeing in the scripture, we can relate to. And I think that that's the power of studying the Bible is when you can start to relate and say, you know, I, I, I could do that. If I would have been a businessman there, maybe starting off with very good intentions, I'm just helping these worshipers to be able to worship acceptably. And well, it would help my business if I'd get a little closer. And then before you know it, now it's all about, it's more profitable to be here and, uh, and totally lose sight and, 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 and respect for God's house, the Father's house. And so I, I, I think when we can get our mind to see, mm, I could do that, then it's more helpful to us as we look at the Scripture. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Anything else? All right, so when Jesus was at Jerusalem for the Passover, during the feast, many believed. Why did they believe? He's working signs, and they're seeing those signs, and so they're believing in His name. Now, when it says they're believing in His name, I don't, I don't think they're saying, yeah, I think His name really is Jesus. I think that's what is, I think that's what is on the birth certificate. I think it's Jesus. That's not what it's saying. What is, the, what is the idea? Authority. 
I believe in his name and who is, what is his name? He's the son of God. He's, I mean, if you want to take Jesus, it's Yahweh saves. He's the savior. And so I think that they are believing that he is the Christ. But then notice what Jesus does. Jesus does not commit himself to them because he knows all men. He had no need for anyone to testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So they're saying, we believe you, we believe you. Does Jesus get excited about that? No. It, yes, that's right. Uh, by the way, some of these same people would be the ones chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And so he knows. He, he, he doesn't go, oh, well, I feel so much better now that y'all are behind me. You know, I was afraid y'all wouldn't accept me. No, he, he knows. And so he's not committing himself to him. He wasn't disillusioned about man's fickleness on, on that. I do like to just re-highlight the same thing Lonnie said. They believed when they saw the signs. And Jesus' signs weren't just for his own benefit. They were to uh, kind of to prove to others the things he was saying was true. You know, to, to the things he was saying, they were able to justify that. They were able to show this is truly my identity. I'm not just saying it, but I can prove to you I am. That when they see the signs, they believe. And I think that's a good thing to see throughout the scriptures. What the purpose of the signs is, is to, to help support the ministry. So it might be interesting to note here that the people are gaining gaining some faith in Jesus by what he's doing outwardly. But Jesus does not gain faith in the people because of what he knows they already know. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of interesting idea. Yeah, nice way to put that. Yeah. If you couldn't hear that, uh, Austin said that the people are gaining uh, faith. What would you say? Yeah, gaining faith in Jesus because of what he's doing outwardly. Jesus is not gaining confidence in the people because of what he knows is going on inwardly in them. And so I think you said it better than that. But anyway, I think chapter 3 is going to give us an example of this. So the people are believing in him because they see the signs, but Jesus is not having confidence because he knows that their faith is not very deep. You notice, I liked the connection here. Verse 25, he knew what was in man. And then what does the next verse say? There was a man. And so let's just, let's just look inside and see what's going on with men here. And so we're introduced to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And what is Nicodemus? He's a ruler of the Jews. He's a Pharisee and he is a ruler of the Jews. And so in a sense, he represents the Jews. And I think that that's right. As we look at the belief that the Jews have in Jesus, I think Nicodemus kind of personifies that. And he kind of shows that forth. So he comes to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with them. So he sees the signs. He believes that he is a teacher come from God because nobody could do these signs. So he's got this level of belief because he's seen of the signs there. And what does he call Jesus? Rabbi, which means teacher. And we believe you're a teacher come from God on this. I want to make a point here, and, and I want to be careful with it, but I do think there's some significance in it. When did Nicodemus come to Jesus? By night. Now, I don't know exactly why John put that in there. And if John just put it this one time, I don't even think it would catch my attention. I think I would look at it as an incidental detail that's given there. But the three times that John mentions Nicodemus, every time he mentions he's the one who came by night. And something that Jesus says here in this statement may connect with that, may connect with that. And so I point that out. I don't, I don't want to make too big of a deal out of it. I don't want to speculate a whole lot about it, but it is interesting that John mentions that three times about Nicodemus, that, G, that Nicodemus was the one that came at night. So he comes to Jesus and he says, we believe you're a teacher come from God because you couldn't do these things unless God was with you. And then Jesus just like bulldozes him here by saying, I say unto you most assuredly, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Um, exactly what does that mean? Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. I think that he typifies the way the Jews are thinking. The Jews thought of the kingdom belonging to who? To the Jews. To a physical descendant of Abraham. And Jesus says... Yeah, you're a physical descendant of Abraham, but I'm telling you, you have to be born again if you're going to enter the kingdom. And so Nicodemus is chewing on this a little bit. And he said, 
how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? I don't. I, I think he knows that's impossible. He's saying, I, I'm not quite sure what you're saying here, though. Explain this a little bit more. What do you mean by that? And so Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so what I'm telling you is being born of Abraham's seed is not enough to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born of water and the Spirit. Uh, what do you understand water to be here? Baptism? Would that make sense at this point? Why would it make sense? John, what has John been preaching? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what do we need to do? You need to be baptized for repentance. Jesus comes preaching. What's his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what do I need to do? What, what was Jesus and his disciples doing? They were baptizing. And so I do think that that makes sense even at this. You have to be born of water, but water and the Spirit. The whole purpose of that repentance was a change. A change. A change in spirit. A change in thinking. A change in mind. And so there needs to be a change in you. Just being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough. There has to be a deep-seated change in you where your spirit changes. Only then can you enter the kingdom of God because you've got to be born of spirit because the kingdom is spiritual. And you've got to be spiritual. You have thoughts on any of that? Talking about, you know, you must be born again. A new birth. It reminds me of passages like Ephesians 4, starting in verse 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So I think that's a passage that may help explain, you know, what does it look like to be born of, of water and born of the spirit? Well, here's kind of a, an example we maybe see later in the New Testament. It's a, it's a change, a renewing of your mind, and, and Basically becoming a new man once you get to that point. So it reminds me of passages like that. Yeah. And you know, God had prophesied this. Back in Ezekiel, uh, God made the point that the Jews who had been unfaithful to him, he said, I will take you from among the nations. I'm in Ezekiel 36 and verse 24, just in case you want to know. Uh, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you to your own land, and then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you from all the filthiness of your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will take the heart of stone out of you of your flesh and give you a heart and give you a heart of flesh. I will put uh, my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments to do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I give, gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And so all the way back, God was saying, really to be my people, you're going to have to be born of water and the spirit. And so Jesus is, is reiterating that there. Anybody have any, any thoughts through verse 6? So Jesus says, you shouldn't marvel about this. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Um, it was pretty easy to tell if somebody was, a, a, at least a male, if it was a son of Abraham. He bore a mark on his flesh. Circumcision. Is it as easy to see physical traits of one who's born of the Spirit. Now, they look pretty much like everybody else. Pretty much like everybody else. But you can see a difference. You can see that they are different. And it's not by observing their body and because they do something with their body. It's by the way that they behave. And like the wind. How many of you believe that the wind exists? How do you believe it? You can't see it. You see what it does. And the, by the way, spirit, the, the literal word spirit means wind or breath. And so what Jesus is saying, those who are born of the spirit, you see the power of that in their life. You see the influence of that in their life. It's not like circumcision, but you see a change in character. Anything? All right, you got anything?
Well said. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? So how is it that all of this takes place? If God's plan is not just for somebody who's the physical seed of Abraham to, to inherit the kingdom of God, well then how is God going to bring about people entering the kingdom? And, and how does that all work? Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? By the way, remember what Nicodemus said to him? We know you're a teacher come from God. Well, what kind of teacher? Well, a rabbi. You know, you're a rabbi. Is he just a rabbi? Is he a rabbi like Nicodemus is a rabbi and a teacher? No. And so Jesus kind of puts this out. How are you one who leads God's people and you don't understand this? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Okay, it's him and Nicodemus having a conversation, and Jesus says, we, but is he talking about himself and Nicodemus? No, because he contrasts that with you. So who's he talking about? Yes. You are a teacher come from God. Hmm. We. Ah, more than just a teacher that comes from God. This is God. This is part of the Godhead. And so we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So how, how is this all going to work that people become, they're, they're born again spiritually and, uh, and they're renewed spiritually to be part of this kingdom? Well, I'm not sure you're ready to understand this yet. But here we go. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. How is God going to bring about a renewed spirit where people can be in His kingdom? What's the plan? How is this all going to come to pass? He's going to have to die. That's right. God's only begotten Son is going to have to be a sacrifice to atone for man's sin. Uh, who else had an only begotten Son that they offered up as a sacrifice? Yeah. I think that using that phrase, only begotten Son, in this context, should key up in Nicodemus's mind, oh, our father Abraham. He did that. But it wasn't for the atonement of mankind. But Jesus would be. So he, Jesus uses an example from the Old Testament here. Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Can somebody tell me that, that story that Jesus is referencing? Everybody's being bitten by snakes. And what happen, what's happening to them? They're dying. So they come crying to Moses. Moses goes to God. God tells Moses to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and stand it up in the camp. And what was the instruction? Everyone who is bitten can come and look upon it, and they will live. Okay. It does, yes. It later becomes an idol, many years later. And, uh, and, and so Hezekiah, I think, is the one that... I think he's the one that ends up uh, uh, destroying it. Um, but we digress. Um, and, and so you have to go and look upon this. Okay, uh, I'm on the outside of the camp or on the outer edge of the camp here. I get bitten by a serpent. Oh, no, I'm going to die. I don't believe all of that stuff. How is looking upon a serpent, going to a bronze serpent on a pole going to heal me? I don't believe in that. What's going to happen to me? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. So the ones who would make their way to look upon it are trusting in the power of God to save them. God said, this is the way that I'm going to deliver you. And so they would go and, and make the effort to put their trust in God to do this. That was foreshadowing 
that God was going to hang up on a pole the one who could save from Satan's poison of sin. And in looking forward to that, now I don't know that the Jews got that at that point, but what Jesus is, Nicodemus is saying, well, how is all this going to happen? And Jesus says, this is how it's going to happen. People are going to be saved through me and through my sacrifice. And it's through trusting in me and believing in me and following me that this will happen. So this is a pretty, probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. This is a very powerful section of Scripture, though, because what Jesus is explaining to a Jew who represents kind of the Jewish nation is, here's what you have to understand. It's not by being a physical seed of Abraham that's going to save you. It's going to be by trusting in me that you will be saved, that you will be born again, that you will be added to the kingdom. And so uh, a lot condensed in here, packed in here. Going back to Numbers 21 too, why were the people bitten by the fiery serpents in the first place? They were complaining. Yeah, they were complaining. So this is, in a sense, God's judgment. You know, he sends the fiery serpents upon them. And so adding that layer there, here's God's judgment. Is this a physical judgment? <laughs> Sending the serpents? Yes. So he gives them a physical thing they can trust in, they can look at. Now, in our time, under the new covenant, we may sin. We have sins just like they did in Numbers 21. We probably receive spiritual judgment, in a sense. But God has given us something that we can look at for spiritual redemption, and that's Jesus. Something we can look to, not just look at, but look to and trust in, put our faith in. And so, in a sense, both of these are ways out of judgment. One is kind of more physical-based, but just like Lonnie said, it's a foreshadow to that spiritual redemption we can have in Christ, like he so well put. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Good point. Okay. Uh, I'm going to speculate just here a little bit, and, and you tell me if, if this holds water. But first, let me ask you the question. Why might Nicodemus come at night? What are some possibilities? Yes. So he's kind of ashamed to, to, to be seen with Jesus. Jesus has already rocked the boat with the cleansing of the temple. And by the way, Nicodemus, he's part of the Sanhedrin council. He's an important leader of the Jews. And so maybe, maybe going and saying, I know you're a teacher come from God. Maybe that's something he would rather not everybody know at this point. So I think that's reasonable. What are some others? Yeah, maybe that was the most convenient time. Maybe Nicodemus was busy all day and this is the first chance he's got. So I, I want to be careful not to read too much into this. But like I said, I don't think I would even notice this except John mentions it three times. And then there's something here in this next section that makes me wonder. Verse 19, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds to be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done by God. Maybe there's just a little hint in this that Jesus is probing at Nicodemus and saying, you came to me in darkness. Did you come to the light? Or do you love truth? Is that, is that why you came to me? Or do you not love truth? And do you, do you want to remain in darkness? So I don't know. But uh, either way, the point that Jesus is making there is not everybody's going to accept the truth about him. And the reason that a lot of people are not going to accept this is because they don't want their deeds exposed. They don't want to have to change. They don't want to, they don't want to believe that. And so, uh, I don't know what happened here. I ended up hitting the button too many times. It, and maybe that, that would apply to Nicodemus, but it applies to all of us. Any thoughts through verse 21? Yes. Will not believe. Right. Believe. And I think that's what he's saying. You know, he's indicating to Nicodemus at this point, in this part, part of the conversation, you're an unbeliever. Yeah. You're trying to figure me out. Yes. Right now, you're an unbeliever. It seems like he becomes a believer later. Yeah. But at this point, he's not. Yeah. I think that. So he believes in the signs, but a believer 
and really who Jesus is and what Jesus is going to do, not there yet. And I think that represents the Jews. That's the reason Jesus is not committing himself to them is because that's where the Jews are at as a whole as well. Very good, very good. Came to condemn, and part of the question says he came to save. But you know, we know that he came to unite people like the Jews and the Gentiles. And all. We also came to divide, right? You said so. yes. So you know, he didn't come to condemn. It con it, condemnation it is a result yes. of him because because people are going to reject him. And they condemn themselves in that. That's not the purpose that Jesus came. Jesus came to be a savior, but people wouldn't accept that savior. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay, he didn't come to condemn, so he's not going to condemn anybody. But that's not what it's saying. It's people will be condemned because, like I said, so they're choice. Mm -hmm. That's not why he came. Yes, that's right. Simeon's words when he was filled with the Spirit that he'll be responsible for the rise and the fall of many, mm -hmm. but when hearts are revealed. And so I think that plays into it. It's it's the heart's response to that that leads to that he wants our hearts to respond yes. positively. So he doesn't have to condemn. But Yes, sure. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which was also a natural consequence of the way people respond. Very good. Yes. That's right. I think when you look across this section too, and especially reading eighteen through twenty-one, you know, John three sixteen is a famous verse, and in, in the emphasis there is on believing. I think you get the idea. This belief is a commitment. It's uh, your allegiance. It's, it's so much deeper than just having a conscious belief. And yes, I do believe that he's the Savior. You're getting the idea of, of walking in darkness and deeds being evil um, versus loving truth. You know, walking in the light that, that uh, there's a contrast there. And I think it's a commitment one way or the other. I think that's the kind of the core idea behind belief. And I think there's several places in the Bible you can look at that will help support that. But I think here's one up that you can tack on all that with that verse. And, and put it in its context. Do you not think you challenge Nicodemus right now? It's probably because he is kind of right in the midst of people. Yes. You know, he's challenging him to commit to the things that he's he's seeing. Yes. And what he does is based upon that. He knows he's a man of God. Right. He gets to that. Yeah. So Very, good. Very good. Very good. just inquisitive and commit to it. Very good. I think for me, it helps me to replace the word believe with trust. Trust God, or you believe Jesus, and whatever He says, you're going to follow Him. Yeah. It's like if you, you know, if you're in battle with somebody, and they say, "Hey, don't go out there; you can get shot." You don't go. Right. Just as He says, "Don't do these things, or you will die." Yep. It's the same, same thing. That's right. Whoever trusts in Him should not perish, but have everlasting. Mm -hmm. Let's go now. Maybe when we look at Nicodemus, we sometimes try to figure out why did He come to town, but we forget that He came, and that's the most important. He, out of all these people who had seen all these signs, who had seen the Jesus that we didn't see because we're only reading about it, he saw that man and his, I don't want to say curiosity, but his <coughs> desire to know more mm -hmm. is what created in him this impulse to go. Yes. And that's what we have to do. Right. We don't, it, it doesn't matter how we look in and how we look. We have to go to Jesus. We have yes. To come to him, whatever our situation is. Excellent point. Yes. Very good. Very good. I wonder if uh, verse 17 was helpful for Nicodemus <clears throat> after the account we looked at when Jesus come in and, and drives the people out of the temple. You know, God did not come to condemn. So maybe that's helpful for him. Yeah. Be. Any other thoughts? All right, well, we will end there at verse, verse 21, and we'll pick up in verse 22 next time, and then jump over to Matthew 14. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day. Thank you.